Hi everyone, this one is a little different. Um, I did an interview for a podcast called The Genomics Life back in February before COVID, um, which is a podcast by my good friend Kelly Moffat. And I was one of the first interviews on her podcast. It was really cool. I had a great time um, with this interview and I wanted to share it with you. Um, I don't know why I didn't think to do this sooner, uh, but in case you don't happen to already be following the Genomics Life podcast, which is pretty new, it started this year, uh, 2020, and yeah, in case you haven't seen it, I or hadn't heard it, I thought I'll cross-post it here. Um, so I highly encourage you to check out the rest of the episodes. Um, Kelly does a really great job. So again, the podcast is called The Genomics Life. And I'll mention this again at the end so that you can Google it um, or search for it in Apple Podcasts or whatever you use. Um, but I highly recommend that you check out the other episodes of that as well. It's right up the alley of the other things we've been talking about on this channel. So um, without further ado, I will show a picture of Kelly and I Ta-da! and uh, play the episode for you in case you're lazy and you just want to listen to it here. But again, do go check out uh, Kelly's podcast after this. Thanks. Welcome to the third episode of The Genomics Life. I'm your host, Kelly Moffat, and my goal is to give you some behind the scenes stories of the people, their innovations, and exciting work in the field of genomics. Thank you so much if you listened to the first two episodes from the launch last week. I am thrilled that there are some people out there who are enjoying the podcast. Now that it's rolling, I'm going to work on some improvements to the audio, like actually using real microphones instead of clip-ons and doing some cleaning up to the audio. Thanks for your patience and support while I ramp this up. Now let's get into this episode where I talk to Maria Natestead, who is a software engineer on the genomics team at Google Health. Maria currently works on Deep Variants, a deep learning based variant caller. Maria has created several tools used widely in the genomics community, including Circa, Ribbon, Split Threader, Assemblytics, and more. You can find her on YouTube with R and Bioinformatics training videos as well. All right, let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome to the Genomics Life. I am here with Maria Natasad and we are sitting in a hotel room in the beautiful Marco Island uh, Marriott at AGVT mm -hmm. and we're looking out over the ocean and really wanting to get out there ourselves but the podcast comes first. Yes, it's beautiful so, weather. We'll be out by the pool right after this. Yes, but we first, will. science. <laughs> science. It's all for science and genomics. So, Maria, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm Maria. Hi. I did my PhD with Mike Schatz uh, when he was at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And he does happen to be my husband, for the record. Yeah. Just saying. Yep, that's how we know each other. Yep. Um, and yeah, right now I, I've done a couple of things in between, which I'll maybe talk about later. Uh, but right now I'm working on the deep variant team, uh, at Google health. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. I want to hear a lot more about that, but first I want to hear about your history. So you were not born in the U S right? Correct. Yeah. I was born in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Uh, we moved to the U S when I was 13. Uh, first to Las Vegas, which was an interesting experience. It was very, very hot there and very dry. Yeah, I was in Las Vegas until halfway through high school. Mm -hmm. So two years in, we moved in the summer, and I did the next two years of high school in California, mm -hmm. up in Marin, north of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, that was a really nice area. It's a lot of hiking and uh, farmer's markets and stuff. My mom felt really at home there. It was <laughs> <Yes>. great. <laughs> Um, and then I went to college at University of the Pacific, mm -hmm. which is in Stockton. Mm -hmm. And that how was did really you end experience. up at that school? Yeah, it's um, it's funny. My dad actually worked for their dental school, oh. and I didn't really know about American colleges that much. I had been trying to learn about them, but hadn't quite caught up to the whole 
extracurricular thing for trying to get into like the very best schools in the country. So I didn't really try. I just really liked UOP and mm -hmm. we visited there and it was beautiful. It looked kind of like this, but... Um, <laughs> side of the country. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, more like an Ivy League school or something. You know, it had beautiful ivy on brick buildings and it, it just looked really nice. Mm -hmm. And it was a good school. I decided to go there and... Funny story, at first I was going to study business mm -hmm. and then as the as college drew closer, I actually switched my major to biology mm -hmm. uh, because I decided I wanted something that was really challenging for me. Actually, business would have been very challenging. I'm a lot of an introvert, so mm -hmm. uh, for me, yeah, like the teamwork at first seemed like really scary. Mm -hmm. I've since gotten used to that, but um, I'm glad I did biology. Uh, it's just such a great area because there's so much complexity. I thought if I studied something else, I would eventually run out of yeah. things. But in biology, you never run out of anything to study. That is so true. Yeah. It's just one thing after another as you learn more and go deeper. And the technology improves and computational power improves. And... Yeah. And if nothing else, we discover new biological organisms yeah. all the time so I can always study a new one so we'll never run out which <laughs> is what is I was true. afraid of for some reason as a teenager I was afraid that at some point in my career I will run out of things to do uh -huh. that's, that's no longer uh, yeah yeah there's no longer a thing I'm afraid of that's great <laughs> this field yeah. is the best for that for not having to worry of, about new things to work on so yeah. okay so then you're in college and you're now in biology and what happened next? Yeah, I I really enjoyed doing biology. I ended up doing some undergraduate research, which was amazing. Um, shout out to doctors Lynn Chirigino and Lisa Rishnik. They're awesome. I did research with them mm -hmm. in undergrad. Um, I think they're still teaching there. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really great. And I, because of that experience, I got into a summer undergraduate a research fellowship at Rockefeller University and I tried my hand at a little bit of kind of neuroscience uh, but I discovered during that time that I really wanted to automate the things that I was doing every day mm -hmm. it was very heavy wet lab work looking at worms under a microscope we'll see elegance yeah um, and I just thought okay we need robotics for this mm -hmm. um, because I want to spend more of my time thinking about the experiments and not carrying them out mm -hmm. um, for so many hours a day. Like tedious lab work. Yeah, yeah. it was very tedious. It was mutagen a mutagenesis screen for okay. 10 weeks, Ugh. just looking under the microscope Ugh. every day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, eventually I kind of decided that I want to do more computer science. Mm -hmm. And I thought at first that that this would be challenging to combine with biology, but then I discovered that bioinformatics already existed <laughs> and had been around and I just didn't know about it. Right. So I immediately started applying to PhD programs in bioinformatics mm -hmm. and that's how I ended up at Cold Spring Harbor eventually. How did you find Cold Spring Harbor? Oh yeah, that's another funny story. I was tutoring uh, for a program at, my, at uh, UOP that helped first-generation college students and they had this uh, graduate school event that they were going to at UCSF. Mm -hmm. And so I went on the bus with all of them as like an honorary, like, oh, you can come along for the trip that we usually do for our students. But as a tutor, I got to come along. And there were all these tables of different graduate schools laid out. And one of them was Cold Spring Harbor. And it was the only one that was focused on biology. Everyone else did everything. Mm -hmm. But Cold Spring Harbor was kind of special. So they had a booth at this thing? Yes. Okay. And I applied to the there? ERP program, but I didn't get in. Oh, that was when you were... Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was before Rockefeller. Okay, okay. Um, so I didn't get in, mm -hmm. but then later they did send me, like, you can apply to our school for free. So I was like, okay. All right. You waive the application nice. fee, I'm there. Mm -hmm. So so I applied, and um, yeah, once I arrived, it was like, wow, this is a whole different caliber. Like, mm -hmm. I had only applied to the best schools that I could find, but I was actually really impressed by Cold Spring Harbor, even though it was the one I knew the least about mm -hmm. when I started. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there had just been so many smart people who had been there, and all the other people interviewing were in awe of the place, right. which really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, a it very different inspired. experience to be there, and it's not 
your typical university setting it's very very different yeah it uh it looked like a small ski resort mm -hmm. when i first got <laughs> there it was also in february so right it basically it was. was yeah <laughs> yeah which is a lot snowier than right now it's february but uh we're in marco island so yeah, that's a, a little, little bit different yeah a little bit sunnier tiny bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so so you got in and started in the fall at Cold Spring Harbor, and how was that PhD program? It's good. It was intensive. They pack all the classes into the first semester, mm -hmm. basically. So it uh, it was cool. I learned neuroscience mm -hmm. for real for the first time, and uh, yeah, Mike Schatz's classes and Mickey Atwal's and some of the computational courses there were also really good. Mm -hmm. I, I learned a lot of things that I still use to this day in mm -hmm. those classes. Right. Yeah. And then I ended up uh, choosing Mike Schatz to, uh, to do my research work with. Right. Yeah. How'd you decide on Mike? I can't imagine. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was great. Um, yeah, he... He actually impressed me right from the beginning when I was interviewing with him because he gave me an interview question that while he hinted me through it, I learned something new about biology and mm -hmm. about computational biology that I had never heard of before. Um, what did he have you do? Yeah, we, uh, we base he was uh, asking me to find Gattaca in the human genome. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Classic problem. He pulled out a phone book and divided it in half uh -huh. and a bunch of other interesting things during this time. It, it was yeah. a... It was a really good interview, mm -hmm. and I actually learned something. I was like, wow, I've never learned something in an interview <laughs> right, before. It's that just doesn't happen. On, yeah, totally. Yeah, so that was a really good experience. And, uh, and Mike was very supportive, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, just the research he was doing was really fascinating. Right. I could see a lot of opportunities to be part of that. Right. Awesome. And then what was your big project that you worked on? I mean, I know what it was, but could you yeah. tell all of our <laughs> listeners what it was? Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a number of ideas from the beginning. One of them is actually like the pan genome work that's now kind of coming into its own in the field right yes. now. Yeah. It, was, it was an idea that was a little bit ahead of its time, but we're not the only ones to have that idea. Mm -hmm. But it was one that I never got very far on because... I got distracted by this awesome project that was just my aim too, that became my entire PhD thesis, uh, which was doing pack bio long read sequencing in a breast cancer cell line called SKBR3. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to understand the structural variants in that cell line. And especially, I started focusing on long range variants. Uh, there have been these huge rearrangements. The karyotypes showed that there were now, I think it was. 86 chromosomes instead of 40 yeah <laughs> 46 yeah. so it was kind of crazy and yeah I just wanted to get at that with sequencing and try to understand how the different pieces of DNA had moved around yeah. that was something I got a little bit obsessed with mm -hmm. um, and I ended up doing a lot of in-depth work especially in the HER2 region mm -hmm. because SKBR3 has the HER2 region amplified so this is a a um a gene that when over amplified um makes breast cancer worse mm -hmm. essentially right. that's an oversimplified version right. of it um but you were actually going in and this was from my understanding one of the first cell lines where you're actually able to resolve the chromosomes and understand where the rearrangements were at the structural variant level not just looking at SNPs but actually going in and getting a full picture of what had happened in this cell line. Yeah, um, most cell lines would probably be easier to work out. Yeah. I had chosen one that was very rearranged compared mm -hmm. to normal, so figuring out exactly what happened turned out to be basically impossible. Mm -hmm. um, figuring out the steps in order and figuring out the exact copy number, yeah. um, that was really hard. But we did get a much better view of the structural variation in that genome than I think we've ever really done in in other cancer genomes that are this badly right. rearranged. Right. It was very extreme. Right. Uh, but it provided kind of a good testing ground. I ended up making some tools, uh, especially visualization tools, mm -hmm. because the data I was working with was 
I could see there was so much power in the long read data, mm -hmm. but none of the tools that we had at the time were built for long reads. Um, everything, I mean, the liners were kind of there, um, but right. the variant callers, we ended up uh, pulling other people in lab in. Um, so that's Fritz Salasek. He started building Sniffles, partly because the SKBR3 project needed a variant caller. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I... And your tool that you wrote? Yes, so that. I had a few different things. So right. one of them was a uh, split threader, which was for kind of visualizing where all the rearrangements are in the genome and how they match up with the copy number variants. Mm -hmm. Because when you do see a genomic rearrangement, duplications, things like that, you should expect to see a copy number change to go along with it, and it should be at the same position. Mm -hmm. And we were often looking at copy number a little separately from the rearrangements, which we found by split read variant calling. And so lining them up from different technologies was actually not entirely trivial. It's right. something that I needed to make a visualization that could show me which direction it should go. Yeah. Should the copy number be going up or down, given the split read sense. variant at the same position? Right. Yeah, so that was split threader, and there was a lot of graph work in there, and it's, uh, it's really good just for cancer genomes. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, later I also made ribbon, mm -hmm. which I think is my favorite so far. Yeah. And ribbon, helps you understand how long reads are mapping, um, especially how different pieces of a long read are aligning to different places in the genome and where they are along the read really matters. Yes. So um, there are really great genome browsers that have been around for many years, like IGV, that show you only the reference perspective. And this was enough when we had short reads, because if a read gets split into two pieces, okay, I can kind of see, oh, I have this one here, this one here, and um, they went from this location to this other location. But with long reads, I was suddenly starting to see very large regions. I would have a single read that was split into four different pieces in three different genes mm -hmm. and just connecting them all together. Yes. And it's seeing which order they're in along the read tells you which order the that. genes got stitched exactly. together in, which mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. Yeah. So uh, that was something that I think, um, I think my, my favorite thing to say about Ribbon is that the, the true power of long reads is lost when the tools we use are made for short reads. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The... That's a good way to summarize it. <laughs> Thanks. And yeah. Ribbon's available, like anyone can use it. Yeah, Ribbon is available. It's at genomeribbon.com, and um, we have a paper on the bioarchive right now, and actually we're submitting it to peer-reviewed journals now again. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I also did Assemblytics, which for, right. was for assembly-based variant calling, and, and since then there's been even more tools, and yeah, it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very awesome. <laughs> All right, so you did the P you did your PhD. You did it super fast too. How many years was it? It was three and a half years. That's crazy. Exactly. Yeah, that's a yeah. lot. It's embarrassing a little bit, but I guess I'm still going to talk about it on a podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yay! But um, yeah, when I arrived at Cold Spring Harbor, I. I had heard that Yaniv Ehrlich graduated mm -hmm. in three and a half years, right. and it turned out that Ira Hall had already graduated even faster, also in about three and a half years. Okay. But I asked around um, and the administrators told me that they had actually graduated in like 3.6 years. Oh. But we were allowed to graduate in three and a half years, exactly, according to the accreditation. <laughs> so I, I kind of kept that in the back of my mind, like, ooh, okay. what if I could actually graduate in three and a half years? Right, if it worked out, you could do yeah. it. Yeah. And then you did. Yeah, if I could actually get done in time, and yeah. I somehow did, mm -hmm. and I was actually at HEBT a few years ago when I got the final check yes. that my uh, my thesis had been accepted, mm -hmm. and That's I was so awesome. good to go. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I made it. It was a weird goal to have. It's not necessary to graduate in three and a half years, but it was just something that I thought would be fun, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. it's, it's good to have <laughs> goals like that, and it, it seems like it 
probably like it, there could have been things outside of your control like not having access to the right data or things could have not worked out and then you would have had to adjust but if everything stayed in your control then that's great to have that goal and to actually make it yeah I mean I was surprised it worked um but I did get a paper out in time and then I had a couple more papers that came later right. because everything right. was yeah, that's um, how it works. Yeah, once I got out into the real world, I was still publishing papers right. for my PhD, right. which I think is very normal. Yeah, yeah, no, lots totally of people normal. have work yeah, to wrap great. up. Okay, so you also did an internship when you were at Cold Spring Harbor, right? At mm -hmm. PacBio, was it? Yes. yes. Yeah, so this was kind of the last summer of my PhD. I, I wanted to do an internship in industry because I'd always been interested in going into industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was also part of the reason why I think Mike was okay with me wrapping my PhD up fairly quickly mm -hmm. because he knew that I wasn't going for a postdoc right. and to become faculty and I, I wanted to be kind of part of industry because I feel like there's a lot of interesting work going on there mm -hmm. and they sometimes, sometimes they have more resources, sometimes it's just, uh, sometimes it's more applied work. Yes. Um, not always. There's... Mm -hmm. A lot of exceptions to that but for me I, I also want to get back to the Bay Area mm -hmm. which is a, just a really great place to be for a biotech in industry tech, for yeah. sure um, I never dreamed that I would end up in tech and working for Google though right. that was a that whole other story right. <laughs> yeah but yeah things change over time absolutely yeah so PacBio was a, was a good internship and yes you learned a lot yeah, I definitely learned a lot. That was where I built Ribbon. Mm -hmm. um, I was basically just trying to think, okay, what can I do that will be useful for PacBio's users? Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing I could think of was something that I had been missing myself, exactly. which was the ability Smart. to see long read alignments in a way that uh, basically lets me understand what's going on at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need summary stats. I need to see every read because right. in PacBio, Visualize. every read matters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Visualizing that data helped mm -hmm. a lot. Okay. Yeah, and I got to work with Jason Chin, who's yeah, awesome, he's awesome, of course. <laughs> yes. Okay, so then, but after you graduated with your PhD, you decided to do your own thing for a little while, right? Yeah, I had been obsessed with trying to start my own business. Mm -hmm. And so I did. After my PhD, I basically just was like, okay, I'm starting my own company. And I, I called it OMG Nomics <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know, we're excited about genomics or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, it flows. Yeah. And I made a YouTube channel um, as marketing for a product that didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but the YouTube channel is also just helping people get into bioinformatics, yeah, which is something I wanted to do. You started that at Cold Spring Harbor, right? The YouTube stuff? Yeah, you were still I, getting your PhD when you started doing that, right? I had a different YouTube channel. So oh, okay. That was yeah. the more like uh, R stuff, right? It was exactly. Like, yeah. That was the R course. Yes. I did plotting an R for biologists. Yes. So that was me first dipping my toes into yeah. doing YouTube videos. Right. Um, that one is also kind of another one of my favorite things because it's this little thing that I did in grad school, but right. people are still using it. Right. And I still get nice comments on YouTube sometimes saying, oh, thank you. This is the best explanation of heat maps I've seen. <laughs> yeah, like, totally. Yes. Awesome. So yeah. glad it helps. Um, yeah. With okay, so you did the YouTube. So you already had ventured into doing some educational YouTube stuff. And so now you have your company that you're starting. So you just start rolling out the YouTubes, right? Yep, basically. <laughs> basically. Yeah, this time around, there was a lot more bioinformatics career advice. The mm -hmm. first video was um, in bioinformatics, what language should I learn first? Yeah. Like what programming language? And what was it? Python? Uh, yeah, I would definitely say Python. Uh, Bash is also helpful. I, Otherwise, you can't run SAM tools, Bash right? Bash is so <laughs> underrated. I think more people need to be aware that they need to learn it. Yeah, I think also people don't realize that they're using Bash. They're just oh, using yeah. the they're command like, line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't realize that they're using it. So yeah. I recommend it, but a lot of that's because you need it to run SAM tools, bed right. tools, BWA, every variant call on a liner out there, yep. and Absolutely. most other tools, mm -hmm. including some of mine, mm -hmm. um, and deep variant. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all good. So, uh, yeah, there, there was a lot of 
YouTube videos uh, in the early days of OMG No Mix, mm-hmm. and I also built Circa, which yes. um, which was a product I had that like made real money, not enough to pay the rent, but Actual real money. money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was a web based um, tool to do circos plots, right? Yeah, it it it's used for making circos plots. So Which all are that difficult credit goes to, to make, the original say. circos. Um, but I but they're not easy I re implemented everything in D three yeah. so that it would be interactive right. and would be easy to make. So you don't have to make a configuration file. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually made it as a desktop application, mm-hmm. but. It used Electron, so I used Electron to turn a web application into a desktop okay. app. And by doing that, you can save the files back to your own computer mm-hmm. and make changes to them like you do with Word documents. Right. And that's something that's really hard to do on the web. Absolutely. You have to download it each yeah. time and re-upload it, and it's yeah. just a mess. Right. Um, so I, I thought that was a better way to deliver it to people, mm-hmm. and that also means that people have it forever. I don't right. have to run a server. Mm-hmm. Um, if I ever can't um, support running a server anymore because I only had one customer, yeah. then this would be a way that that customer could keep having access to Circa forever. Right. Um, and so that's basically going to be the case for as long as Electron is supported. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you have that product out there, and then what happened? Uh, yeah, I, I also built Cordial, which is for chord diagrams, and that came oh. because some people wanted to use Circa to make chord diagrams, but it couldn't because it built Circa for genomic data. Mm-hmm. So it's all based on the chromosome coordinates. Um, so then I built Cordial too, basically just to make those people happy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and some of them were very happy, that's so great. that's also a product in its yeah, own right totally. now. A uh, bit of a spin-off, and... Yeah, but at one point I kind of ran out of ideas. Mm-hmm. Circles plots was a big one that I had wanted to solve, a big painful problem right. that had bothered me in biology. Just doing my own PhD, I had tried to make circles yeah. plots and it was very painful. It was painful. Yeah, so after kind of checking that off with Circa, I was like, mm-hmm. okay, now I feel like I've solved the circles plotting problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's easier now, cool. Now what? Right. Um, and I wanted to have an impact a little bit closer to patients and um, I, I do like working with scientists but I also kind of want to think like how can I how can I do bigger things mm-hmm. and the way to do that for me was to join a company that already has some bigger efforts going mm-hmm. and see if I can latch on to that and uh, try to improve some of those efforts yeah. at least from the visualization standpoint right so yeah I ended up joining DNA Nexus mm-hmm which was a really good experience. Mm-hmm. Um, had some open source tools there too. There are almost too many to mention at this point. <laughs> I guess I'll say the names in case yeah, you want to look them up. Um, one of them is called Dot, which is for making dot plots. Yep. That kind of came out of Assemblytics a little bit, but mm-hmm. much more interactive in creating dot plots. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was Big Top, which is a VR project that I did along with a couple of colleagues, oh, Sam yeah. Westreich and Chris right. Meyer. Mm-hmm. And they we did this project on Friday afternoons. It was mm-hmm. Right. Fun. It was like your percentage of your time that you can work on fun things. Or, yeah. yeah. We had something like a 10% time, I mm-hmm. guess. They, they kind of took that concept from Google's 20% yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, but it was just like Friday afternoons. Mm-hmm. Um, and we built kind of a Manhattan plot in three dimensions yeah. that was also kind of a circles plot. So you're standing in the middle of a circle and then you have... Um, all the dots from a Manhattan plot are spread right. around you in a circle, mm-hmm. and they're higher up the more significant they are statistically. It's very cool. So that was, that was kind of a fun project, mm-hmm. just like really playing with visualization yeah. at that point. You're really getting literally into the visualization. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we just published that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I think there's a theme here, which is you really like visualizations. You're, like, bringing data to life. And that's, yes. that's where you've gravitated. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one thing that was really interesting to me was at some point during my own work, I, I came to AGBT. Yeah. There's a theme here, I think. <laughs> AGBT seems to feature in my life. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I saw a talk by Mark DePristo a few years ago who talked about Deep Variant mm-hmm. here at AGBT. And that was the first time I had seen deep learning really work in genomics. Yeah. 
Um, and I really appreciate that they came to it from not just we're machine learning people and we're going to come in and fix biology's problems. Right. Because I've seen that a lot in different places. And I really appreciate when they start from what are the problems in biology that already exist. And I mean, Mark DePriest and Ryan Poplin were biology people. Mm -hmm. They were both um, a first author on one of the GATK papers. Um, So they knew what they were doing. They were at Verily at the time. And when they built Deep Variant, it surprisingly quickly was able to compete with GATK, Mm -hmm. which I was really impressed with at the time. And since then, it's just improved a lot. It's become more usable, and um, and I've heard really good things. Also at DNA Nexus, um, yeah, Andrew Carroll working at DNA Nexus right. at the time right. wrote a blog post about it and benchmarked it and so on. Right. Um, he eventually got so excited that he joined the Deep Variant team. Right. And then later, so did I. Yes. Also because I love working with Andrew Carroll. He's right. just great. Right. And um, yeah. So, and so that's where you are now. That's where I am now. Uh, the really cool thing for me about Deep Variant is not just how well it works um, or how quickly it runs or all of these great things that people asked me about at my poster yesterday, mm-hmm. but that it turns variant calling into a visualization problem. Mm-hmm. Because once you visualize the data as a pileup image, Deep Variant uses a convolutional neural network to do image classification on that image and turn it into basically is this homozygous reference, heterozygous, or heterozygous alternate. So this is for germline variant calling. Okay, for germline. And it then takes those calls and uses that to output the entries for the VCF. And so variant calling becomes a visualization problem plus machine learning and now you have variants. Right. And that was just really cool, I think, because it means... I'm glad that... you just described that that way, because I was like, I was going to be like, wait, I need you to explain what deep variant is, but now you just did, <laughs> so it's like you're predicting what's coming next. But that was a really good explanation. I don't know that I fully, fully understand it, but I'm getting closer. I should have come to your poster. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to say I have a lot of practice doing it, because I... Then you know, two hours of my poster right. yesterday explaining over and over. the variant over right. and over again. Okay, and, yeah. so you're now you have your VCF file, but it's the way we've arrived at it is different. Exactly, the the normal way of doing variant calling is that you you basically have some statistical or heuristic algorithms mm-hmm. that count the number of reads that support the variant, yes. compare that to the number of reads that don't support yes. the variant, and. Um, there are so many different approaches, I'm not going to discuss right. them, but right. heuristics and statistics basically, yes. and then you have an answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I like about Deep Variant is that instead of us having to tweak those parameters and mm-hmm. say what, what you, the what, thresholds are... How many reads are, you need for, to support each one or whatever. Exactly. Like uh, what number of reads or what percentage of the yeah. reads or so on. We right. just, like we have very very sensitive thresholds. So we do have a stage that does that just to generate candidates, Mm -hmm. but it's very sensitive. We call it the very sensitive caller. Mm -hmm. That's like one of the first steps of deep variant, um, internal to deep variant. Mm -hmm. And once it comes out of that, then the classifier, the convolutional neural network has a chance to just say, nope, I don't think this is a real variant and it gets thrown out, right? right? And I think I just love that it's a visualization problem now mm-hmm. because we can decide how we want to represent the genomic data in a way that it becomes a pileup image that has enough information in it that deep variance convolutional neural network or CNN mm-hmm. can make the classification correctly. Right. That means that I can make visual changes that I can look at myself and play with and experiment with and say, oh, if I add this, can I call it better? Mm -hmm. Can I see this information in there? Because if I can, then usually deep variant can too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just so cool. I can manipulate the visualization. It's like getting closer to using our brains 
through <laughs> computational resources. Yeah, exactly. The pilot image comes from just how humans look at IGB. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Yeah, even in clinical validation pipelines, people are looking at yes. images in IGB. Same. They're so I agree. really yeah. trying to dig in and understand all the data. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's just we want variant callers to get as good as possible so that we have fewer false positives that go into that stage. And even worse, we don't want false negatives. Yeah. Uh, because if they're false negatives, then they are lost completely. Whereas them. false positives could be caught in a later step yes. of validation. Yes, you can't lose data. Yeah. So uh, what, do you, what are you working on specifically with Deep Variant? Like, what is your role in that project? Yeah, everyone on Deep Variant seems to have these really cool um, different projects that are taking deep variant to the next level. So one example is um, my colleague, actually my manager, Pichuan Cheng, mm -hmm. she has a poster here at AGBT about deep somatic, okay. which is the somatic variant calling mm -hmm. version. So that's where you have tumor normal match and you're looking for what's new in the tumor that wasn't in the okay. normal. That's cool. um, yeah, so that's really cool work and we have a few other things in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, I am still kind of getting to know the team and experimenting and seeing like, oh, do I want to make improvements to regular deep variant or do I want to try some kind of offshoot of it? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm already doing interesting experiments and yeah, hopefully someday I'll be able to like publish that and make it right. part of deep variant That's itself. Awesome. Yeah. I just wanted to also touch on some of the outreach things that you've done, like you did, was it Girls Who Code and uh, some other things like that? Any comments or you just, like you've always seemed to have an interest in, in kind of a little bit of an educational or not, uh, you know, promoting women and STEM and things like that. Anything about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've always been interested in education. I think even from when I was little, I kind of wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, these days, I just, I really like, I, I did a lot of tutoring in college, right. even in high school I did, but especially in college. Mm -hmm. um, it was basically like the only job I had for three years right. on the side of college was right. uh, tutoring and teaching chemistry workshops and all of these things. Mm -hmm. I love trying to make difficult concepts understandable. Yeah. That's also where all the visualization comes in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's all just, I, I see something that's hard and I want to make it easier, mm -hmm. mostly easier to understand. Yeah. Yeah, I'm all about accessibility. Right. So for me, um, like computer science was not easy to learn back when I was learning it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We had Visual Basic in school, mm -hmm. and this was proprietary, so I had to, like, I couldn't have a license for that at home, so I couldn't continue practicing the stuff yeah. I was learning at school. I couldn't take it home. Um, and that's just changed so much so now. So much. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I taught the Girls Who Code Club uh, when I was at Cold Spring Harbor for, mm -hmm. in my grad school years, and it was just really cool to see how far the resources have come yeah. that I could now have 13 year old uh, kids, yeah. all girls, uh, learning computer science mm -hmm. from scratch. There's actually a company yep. like a, yep. my kids do that. Scratch. They, my kids started in elementary school wow. with scratch and doing like programming robots and things. It's amazing. It's crazy. I love that that's possible now. Yeah. I, I wish it had been possible when I was a kid. Me but, too. I had yeah. literally the only computer <laughs> classes that I could take in my high school were like, this is a computer, this is RAM, this is ROM. Like nothing else. There was just nothing. <laughs> I learned like, to type crazy. a lot. Yeah, typing uh. was available. <laughs> and, that was, and there was like a spreadsheets class. Oh, I learned to use flash. word processing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's changed a lot, thank goodness. Okay. Yeah, it, it's just come so far. Um, and do you have anything else you want to do with that? Like, are you thinking of doing anything more instructional YouTube stuff or anything else in the future? Or you're just kind of like riding it out right now because you're probably really busy. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I haven't done a lot of big educational things since uh, OM Genomics, mm -hmm. where I did like a video every week. Right. Um, and that was a lot of work, actually. It yes. turns out doing things on YouTube is a lot of work. And yeah. podcasts is a lot of work, too. Yes. 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 Um, 
But the, yeah, I might start doing something like that again in the future. I don't have any concrete plans for that right now. Right, but, but the future just, is wider. It just happens. It yeah. just sometimes I just think like I find something that's difficult, and then I can't help but try to teach it. Yeah, and I'm sure that'll happen soon enough. I mean, it's already happening. Like my poster is about how to understand deep right. variant in more depth. Yeah, uh, because that's, that's what I wanted to know. Itself. Yes. True, true. That's so. awesome. Okay, so what um, what else do you see going forward for yourself? Any Anything you're interested in trying out or doing or learning more about or any directions you want to head in with your career or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Such great questions. <laughs> <laughs> I Right now, I'm really trying to get to know AI a mm-hmm. lot more. Yeah. Um, machine learning is such a powerful tool, and... I am already seeing it working well, but already now, like doing little experiments on deep variant, I'm, I'm getting to know it better, and I want to keep doing that. That's so cool. Right now, I'm focusing on really getting, getting to into that. Learning. Yeah, it's, total, it's different from the work that you did for your PhD and beyond. So, yeah, that's a great opportunity yes. to break into like the latest and greatest and something new. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do like that it's still a visualization problem, so Mm -hmm. I like that we can use image classification, and if I'm tweaking the visualizations up front that go into the image that's then classified, Mm -hmm. then I can apply my visualization skills and my way of thinking about how to make data understandable or concepts understandable, which Mm -hmm. is basically visualization versus teaching. Yeah. Um, I can take that and incorporate it and use it alongside machine learning. Right. And sometimes I see things where it's like, oh, I need to understand machine learning better in order to make this work because yes. I thought this was going to work, but it didn't. So now let me dig in and ask my smarter colleagues who know more about <laughs> machine learning. More experienced colleagues. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's really smarter. cool. Um, what about, what challenges do you see with AI and machine learning, especially applied to genomics? Oh, it's uh, it's just a brave new world. There's so many exciting things that we can do, and it's just a matter of experimenting on different things. Mm-hmm. I see, a, I, I'm not even sure about all the places that it can be applied, and I think that's at least half of the challenge, is just finding what all the challenges are that we still have in biology, where machine learning would fit in well. Yes. Um, it's a really exciting area and I'm excited to see more of that Mm -hmm. it's already happening which is really cool to see uh, when people give talks about using ML of all kinds Mm -hmm. in genomics so yeah I'm kind of I'm watching it I I don't know how much I have all the answers to that absolutely not (laughs) yeah (laughs) awesome okay and then the last thing that I like to ask is, I mean, you've probably already touched on this in many ways, but any specific advice for people who are new to their career, starting out, or maybe even so young that they just have no idea what they want to do, but they heard about <laughs> genomics somewhere or something, like, what could you tell people? Yeah, um, that's a really big one. I There's something that I always keep realizing as I go forward in my career when I was a kid and even just, you know, a few years in the past, I will always, I was thinking that, you know, if I major in biology, then that means I should become a doctor or a biology professor. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing more and more now that there are many different paths that you can take in your career and you can kind of reinvent yourself multiple times if you want to. Mm, Like you said, I've kind of ended up doing that. I just follow my interests. It's always a small uh, tangential move. It's never completely right. dropping everything and starting over. Right. You you build on everything, all your experiences from the past, whether they're directly like going toward a certain point or not. It's it's all building, even if it's a different, it, even if you take some side routes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, you know, I thought back when I was getting into computer science that I had the option of just 
leaving biology behind and doing computer science instead. Uh -huh. And it was only once I realized that bioinformatics existed. Really cool. I was like, oh, I have this option? I didn't yeah. know that. I thought it was an either or. Right. I thought you pick a major and that defines your career. Right. right. For the rest of your life. Because that's like, that used to be the model we were taught. Yeah. That's, that was the, even like, you're very young and that's the, <laughs> even the model you had. So I think it's changing, but the education system has to kind of catch up with the reality of how the world works. Yes. But it's a great reality. I mean, to yeah. be able to do anything. <laughs> Yeah, it's so much more flexible than I thought. It is. And I had so many more opportunities to do interesting things than I thought mm -hmm. and to combine different fields, right? I didn't know I could combine biology yeah. and computer science. Nobody told me this. Yes. Um, but I would say at this point, you can combine almost anything. Absolutely. Why not? Yeah. And with the I internet, just never realized that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As yeah. an adult, it seems so obvious. But when I was a kid, it was like you have to choose from among these right. few different careers well, we're doctor, told. lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> computer programmer who sits in the dark and codes yeah. by themselves all yeah, day and basement. night. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's not how it is, FYI. No, I work at, at Google all. now, I can tell you nobody does that. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. The, the, like when you're little and they're like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like that's the most ridiculous question. Yeah, I mean, we're mostly saying that so the kids will give us funny, like funny answers like, that like we can laugh answers. at them over. Yeah, but... right. And then remind them of later. <laughs> Yes, when they're older. <laughs> exactly. I actually have a funny thing on that. Um, my grandmother's sister kind of helped raise me a little bit uh -huh. um, when there were childcare issues in mm -hmm. my very young uh, days. And she was just a, a big influence for me growing up. Uh -huh. uh, she was like a grandmother to me. And she, she was telling me recently that when... I was a kid and she, people would ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. And she asked me this. I said, well, there's all these different things, right? So on Monday, I want to be a hairdresser. <laughs> on Tuesday, I want to be a teacher. And on you Wednesday, a job for each yes, day of the week. Exactly. That's amazing. And, and I'm realizing now that that's a little bit what I ended up yeah, doing. Like I, I have multiple that. things and yeah. I, I have this mishmash of different fields that I get to do for my career. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do genomics, I do visualization, I do web app development. Yeah. Um, now I'm doing podcast. machine learning. Everything. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So there, there's all these different things and yeah, teaching that's, mm -hmm. uh, basically part of it. Right. You so, can always teach too. You can always integrate that anytime you want. You, like so yeah. many things. It's amazing. Yeah. It's basically like having a different job every day of the week. I just get to mash them all together into yeah. something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. Yeah. And Young Maria, she that. knew everything. <laughs> she <laughs> right. had it figured out. There's wisdom in children. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Untapped potential in wisdom. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining me here. Uh, and now we need to get out to the ocean yes. and enjoy the weather the beach while we're and still the here. Pool. It's a uh... highly recommend AGBT, although I don't think it's going to be here next year at this location. Yeah, I think they said it was going to be in Orlando. Yeah. So, oh, well, still anyway, Florida. Thank you, Maria, for <laughs> doing this. And uh, everyone, I will put some links to your stuff so people can find you. And uh, goodbye, everyone. Yeah, thanks for thanks listening. For <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Genomics Life. If you enjoyed it, please click the subscribe button. Thank you for your support and have a great day. All right. I really enjoyed re listening to this podcast, actually. Uh, it's pretty fun to think about what the world was like right before COVID uh, shut everything down in the US. Um, but yeah, it was a nice, bright, different time when we were at a hotel at the beach and stuff. Uh, but anyway, if you want to hear more episodes from Kelly on the genomics life, hear her interview other much more interesting people than me, um, then definitely go search for the genomics life on your favorite podcast app. <laughs> All right, I will see you soon for another video, maybe, if I get around to it. I hope to get around to it soon. Otherwise, have a happy new year and happy holidays and good riddance 2020. <laughs>